Thank you for joining us for another episode of Crucial Conversations. I've come to the conclusion that just a lot of people are scared about sharing the gospel. It's not that they don't want to talk about Jesus. It's not that they don't want to tell their neighbor about how God has changed their life. No, they, they are thankful for it. They love to do it. But the fear is they just don't know how. And sometimes I think we've made it very complicated and we've made people feel unless they have a degree or unless they have schooling, unless they have some sort of, of grounding and in, in, in conversational ethics that they just can't do it. But the reality is anybody and everybody can share their faith. It only takes getting the conversation started. So it's our privilege today to have Dr. Paul Kaufman to share with us a little bit about conversational evangelism. And we hope that as you listen, you'll be encouraged and get out there and practice and share the gospel. You can do it. I can do it. It just takes getting the conversation started. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman, for being here with us on this crucial conversation. And uh, we're so glad that you're here and taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're a busy man. But uh, thanks for stopping in and being part of this. I'm happy, delighted to share with you today. I'm looking forward to this. Well, we are too. I, I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce you. And uh, I started running out of paper. And uh, you are the chair of the Bible and Theology here at Hope Sound Bible College. That's correct. How long, how long have you been there? Uh, I'm in my 18th year now. 18th year. And you are also uh, an author twice. Yes. Is that correct? As a matter of fact. Uh, author from the classroom to the heart and an examination of doctrine of entire sanctification uh, I have read this Wonderful. and I've read several chapters a couple times Wonderful. and uh, one of the things I really appreciate is you taking some of the deeper things and higher things and putting it in a in a verbiage for anybody and everybody who's interested in reading they can grasp it so I would want to say thank you for that and I appreciate that and if you haven't read this book People need to read this book. So we're glad that you're here. And uh, man, the list goes on and on. But I feel honored to be sitting here introducing and chatting with the Dr. Paul Kaufman. Well, you know, when people introduce me, they get overwhelmed with my five graduate degrees. And I, I sort of jokingly tell them I, I got the degrees basically to give some credence in our Bible college classroom. Uh, the Bible school I went to did not have all that many uh, people with graduate degrees, and I, I, after I started studying on the graduate level, I, I felt like I owed it to future students. I, I, didn't, I didn't need those degrees to be a pastor. When I got my first doctorate, my church started, pastor, uh, started doctoring me, and I just said, just, just let me be Pastor Kaufman. And I, I, I kind of tell people, I said, all, all those degrees and 75 cents will get me a senior decaf at McDonald's. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, I mean, there's a thousand things we could talk about today, but one of the things that you and I have chatted briefly as you've come and gone on different occasions here is a subject that you just addressed at our recent outreach weekend. And uh, it's a term that you've called conversational evangelism. And uh, I just have been intrigued by that. And uh, we live in a day, you know this, that conversation seems to be dwindling. Just. Uh, whether it's because of COVID, nobody wants to be in each other's space. It's kind of given us an excuse probably to do what we really feel. Uh, and then uh, social media, we're just so glued to our phones, our tablets. And so really uh, venturing out and saying, hey, how are you doing? How's the weather? You know, conversation just dwindles. But uh, it's important. Conversation is very important. So uh, you shared a lot of great material. So I'm just going to ask you this question to start off. What really got your mind uh, in gear towards that this is important, conversational evangelism? Well, I, let me say, I, I started out growing up on a farm, uh, kind of a big inferiority complex, half afraid of my own voice around other people. And uh, after uh, uh, marriage and two kids, the Lord called me into the ministry and uh, <clears throat> if you're going to be a minister, you've got to talk to people. But I was kind of like that 
title of a famous book out there, What Do You Say After You Say Hello? And I have noticed in the classroom and even among fellow ministers, it's not all that hard to flash a smile and say hi to somebody, but what do you say next? Where do you go from there? And even more significantly, how am I going to take this conversation to a spiritual level? I'm not just interested in talking about the weather or politics or something like that. I'm, I'm here to represent Jesus Christ. And so I, I got, a, I got a, a break, if you could call it that. Uh, our first church uh, was in Maryland, and we built a new church in a parsonage. And I bought a lot of the material out of a local lumberyard, very huge lumberyard. They sold a lumber into five states. And uh, we had finished building, and I went in one day, and uh, the, the son, the vice president, son of one of the owners, son-in-law, uh, offered me a job as store manager. And a few months into that, he and another fella that they had hired, another younger guy, uh, we had an opportunity to be sent by our company to a, to a seminar down in Washington, D.C., an hour and a half away, taught by a husband and wife team of communication specialists. This was in the day when video cameras were huge. They set up on big, heavy tripods, and we would role play and take notes. And, and there, were, there were some generals from Fort Meade there, some White House press corps, People were paying big money to go to this thing, and this was a, I could go. So we learned uh, the purpose of that was to teach you how to converse with irate customers and discontented employees. It was called uh, some sort of a, uh, uh, something for managers. So I went, and it occurred to me uh, halfway through that seminar that, hey, I can use some of this stuff in conversing around the church, uh, board meetings, and uh, I began to apply some of the techniques, practice, learned to use them a little bit, got a little more comfortable, and uh, finished 11 years at that church and ended up as academic dean at Allegheny Western College for 17 years. And uh, not long after I got there, I began telling some of the students sort of between classes what I'd learned, and they said, well, uh, share it with us. You know, if it worked for you, it'll work for us. And that developed into a course on interpersonal communication skills. And, uh, and we would role play. I would assign them places, uh, you know, you be the pastor and another gal, you be the wife, and you're going to talk to Mrs. Jones today about whatever her problem is. And students told me years later, I would talk to them after they graduated, and I would say, tell me what, what class in college prepared you for, for what you're doing in ministry? And invariably, a lot of times it would be the preacher's wife. She'd say, that course you did on communication skills, she said, I was a wallflower. But I found out I could talk to people. And, uh, and she said, I applied some of that, and, and I'm much more uh, versatile at talking to strangers now and getting conversations going about Jesus. I dare say that there's probably multitudes of people who would have that same idea of the wallflower, um, not really feeling like they can. I would, I would say that most people that I've come in contact with are people who want to. The fact that conversational evangelism is not happening as often as it should, I don't believe is because they don't have a desire to as much as they are fearful of, what if they ask a question I don't know what to answer, or you know, I'm just, I don't wanna be awkward, so I, it's better for me to say nothing. So uh, in light of that, you said you made a transition of almost afraid of your own voice until now, from my perspective and others looking on, uh, you can talk to just about anybody and everybody and have a good conversation. Could you, could you share some how that works in your life? Yes, I'd be happy to. And, and, and I, I love people. I'm a people person. I love young people. I love my students. And, uh, and I love the Lord. And I want to share. You know, we all know you can't argue with a testimony. So I l look for an opportunity to get my testimony worked into a conversation. Uh, I have found, uh, and we all have to be who we are, what works for me is a compliment. Everybody loves a compliment. You're not going to offend anybody by giving them a compliment. Make sure it's genuine, not something you memorize in a class somewhere, but it's got to be spontaneous. And um, l let me give you an example. Um, I have a niece who is an airline attendant uh, for years, and it's interesting the things she shares with me that attendants are thinking and doing when new people step into the plane. 
So I have found that the best thing I can do when I step in the plane, there's always somebody standing in the galley up there behind the, uh, the cabin and the captain's quarters. And I, I always catch their eye and say hi, flash them my best smile. And they like that. They'll respond. And because they're kind of analyzing every person that comes on that plane, they're looking for problems, you know. And I have a little routine that I do. Uh, frequently, my wife and I will fly together. And uh, uh, she, she has a, a physical issue where she can pre-board. So in open seating, we fly southwest all the time. You choose your own seat. So we go back about seven or eight rows. I always take an aisle seat. She sits beside me. And I said, watch, honey, I'm going to practice today. And, uh, and my wife's a shy person. Oh, she said, just let me know. I said, I, I need to practice. And who knows where it'll lead. So the stewardess comes back, or the, I guess the attendant comes back. And she'll say, uh, hello, uh, can I get you something to drink? And I say, uh, now before I give you my order, I said, I have a question for you. OK. They look at me like, uh, who is this guy? And I'm old enough, I, I could be one of the company officials, so whatever I'm doing, they better play along with it. So I said, uh, yeah, I have a question. I, I said, do you like your job? Oh, yes. They'll say, yes, I like my job. Well, I said, you know, it shows. And they'll smile ear to ear. It does? Yes. I said, I can tell you like your job. That's a compliment. And invariably, they'll pat me on the shoulder, you know, blah, thank you, that's kind of you. And I'll give them my order. I, I, I do this all the time. One day, a, um, a middle-aged uh, black fellow came back to take my order, and I did my little routine with him. You like your job? Yes, it shows. And he kind of hunkered down in the aisle beside me, and we had about a three-minute conversation before he went on taking drink orders. He was just, it just disarmed him. He just wanted to chat with me. And uh, one day, an, an older attendant, I'm going to guess a little lady, maybe in her late 40s, early 50s, same routine, compliment, oh, thank you, she said. And then after she gave me my whatever I drank that day and ate, uh, she came out of the galley, looked back at row eight, walked straight back to me, passed everybody up, came back, patted me on the shoulder, and she said, can I get you something else? Well, I said, this morning you gave us this uh, little biscotti, a pack, two pack. I said, those were excellent. I said, now, Grandma and I here, we have a granddaughter who likes to come to our house, and, and Grandma and Mackenzie, they do a tea time together. And I said, if you'd get me a couple of those biscottis, I said, I'll take those home, and that'll enhance their next tea time together. Well, she said, I'll see what I can do. And she went back up to that galley. About 15 minutes later, she came back with a sack of about 50 of those things in there. <laughs> That was her reward to me for compliment. Now, I didn't compliment to see what I could get out of her, but it, it, it opens people up for discussion. And you know, you, you mentioned COVID, and uh, my, my observation has been that people are kind of feeling like we're all suffering together, and I find them around the grocery store and places just a little bit more open. Maybe they're feeling a little more vulnerable. And so I want to be on my toes to be ready to make an opportunity and then take advantage. Once I get the door open, take advantage of it. So compliments. Uh, obviously, you've mentioned that's, that works on any of us. We all like to, to be complimented. Um, but a lot of young people, a lot of children, are are just right they're looking for people to love them and and care for them yes uh have you used this type of technique have. with with children glad you asked uh for, first of all i'm i'm an older gentleman and i have a deep voice and when the kids come into sunday school and i hunker down to say hello to them they'll scream and run for their mother <laughs> okay so i've worked on that my wife says, honey, you know, you can get through to them. And I've actually asked the Lord to help me to, to work on that. Uh, I fly to Hope Sound three times every semester. And I have a routine that I use. Uh, I stop at Subway about a, about a mile from the airport. I have a, uh, a, fo a former student takes me to the airport. I pick him up at the church parsonage and he takes my car back. And I always turn into the subway just below his house, and I get a sub. I eat half of it in the sub 
shop and the other half on the airplane. I was just turning in one day, afternoon about 1.30, 2 o'clock, uh, kind of an older nondescript car pulled in there and a mother and a little girl got out of it and headed into the sub shop. And it doesn't happen a lot, but on this occasion I just sensed the Lord telling me, I want you to speak to that woman or that child about the Lord. So I haven't done a whole lot of it with children. I thought, okay, Lord, uh, if you'll help me, I'll do it. So as I go through the line, getting my sub ready, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And I knew the Lord was in this because uh, the dining room was completely empty. They picked a little booth, and I followed about five minutes behind them, and I went across the aisle and back one seat, and uh, nobody was around. So this little kid, about three or four, turned around and looked at me. Now, the Lord seemed to prod me to focus on my granddaughter, Mackenzie, who was about the same age. I thought, now, I'm an old man. This kid's going to be suspicious of me, probably not going to want to talk. But if I can talk about Mackenzie, that'll distract her and give us a little focus. So she whipped around and looked at me, and I said, why, you remind me of my, my granddaughter, Mackenzie. She's about your age, and she's just friendly looking like you are. There was a little compliment. And I said, and she loves to sing Sunday school songs. And she comes to our house, and, uh, and I said, and she's good at it. And I said, you're about her age. I said, uh, do you know any Sunday school songs? No, she doesn't know any. I said, well, what is your name? And she said, Trinity. And whirled around to look at her mom for approval. And her mother says, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I teach systematic theology. I've heard the term. And, uh, and I said, now, Mackenzie, she, she likes those songs. And I said, now, uh, well, well, where do you guys live? And her mother says, uh, Clinton. Well, it just so happens there is a, an old campground in Clinton, just not too far from the end of the runway at the, at the Pittsburgh airport. And, and, I, and I had to smile. Her mother said, we live right across from the campground in Clinton, and we sit on our front porch, and we watch them do their thing over there in the summer. <laughs> So I, now I know what people do. They watch us do our thing. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? I said, I've got a student who pastors a church about five miles from you. And I said, uh, and his name is uh, Stephen. And I said, and, and he's just married last summer, another one of my students, and they pastor that church. And I said, if they knew how to make connections with you, you could go to their Sunday school and sing the same songs Mackenzie does. Wow. And her mother ripped off a piece of napkin and wrote their phone number and address and handed it to me. And I headed off to the airport feeling like I'd honored what the Lord had asked me to do. He opened the door, preacher and pastor's wife were there, and I flew to Hope Sound, and the first thing I did when I landed was I got on my phone and I said, hey Steve, here's a little Sunday school the girl wants to learn songs, you know, and don't you mess it up either. <laughs> awesome. So that's an example of how it works. and. And I, so I practice, so I can be better with kids. At, now, uh, a year ago, we were out in um, Amish country, I stopped at one of those big uh, Amish buffets. I didn't know that my, my daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter were in the same restaurant clear across on the other side. And we were kind of packed in there at these tables. And uh, so here I am with my wife, and my other daughter was across from us. And here's a little kid with her mom and maybe a grandma or aunt I could almost reach out and touch her. We were packed in there. So when they went up into my, when my wife and daughter went up to get their food, I'm sitting there watching the purses. And I said, well, hi there. And I smiled, you know, and we got a conversation going. She slid off of her chair, came over and talked to me some more. And I have a picture in my collection at home. Found out Mackenzie is across over there. And I have a picture of my older daughter, the nurse, sitting there with Mackenzie in her lap and this little kid in her lap. That's the neatest picture. And if I was in the area, I could have had that little child in Sunday school as well. So just an opportunity. So this is something that can work with adults, children, young people. Really, simply starting off with a compliment and breaking that ice. Absolutely. I, uh, I'm thinking of a situation right now where wife and I were flying from West Palm to Baltimore and uh, we're at the gate. I've got a couple of pieces of luggage I'm watching. My wife has stepped around the corner. And while she's gone, this <clears throat> older gentleman, probably in his early 70s, uh, nice looking tall fella, came almost dashing up there. 
uh, put his briefcase down, opened it up, and mixed up some kind of a solution and quaffed it down. And so I said, well, it looks like some kind of a health drink there. Oh, yes, he said, that's my green tea uh, potion. I do this five times a day. Well, I said, my wife is a nurse and practically a dietitian. She'll be interested in that. And my wife, who doesn't normally strike up big conversations with, with uh, people she doesn't know, if you get her talking about nursing or, or food, dietetic work, stuff like that, well, she, she comes alive. So I said, his name is, is Ron. Ron Roth was his name, and I introduced him to my wife. And she gets into this conversational mode that I'm not used to, because he's a total stranger. And they're just talking and talking. Well, it's time to board. Again, it's open seating. And I said, well, honey, I said, uh, uh, you guys have a good conversation. Go on, why don't you ask Ron to sit with us? And uh, we're, there'll be three seats. Well, he said he'd enjoy that. So I uh, grudgingly gave up the aisle seats, and I took the window. Wife's in the middle, he's on the aisle, and they just talk, talk, talk. Halfway to Baltimore, I'm looking out the window, watching the clouds, wanting to get my oar in the water, but they're not talking about stuff that I, t finally, there was a lull. And I leaned up and I said, uh, Ron, I said, are, are you a religious fellow? Well, he said, you might say I'm a recovering Catholic. Oh, I said, that's interesting, a recovering Catholic. Yeah, he said, I came up through the parochial schools, and I know all the, I had the confirmation, you know, baptized as a child. But he said, uh, he said, you might say I'm a, I'm a man who's looking. I'm on the search. Wow, that was music to my ears. So I, I decided to go this way. I said, well, Ron, I don't know where you're looking, but you got to be careful where you look. I said, uh, there are a lot of false teachings out there. Uh, there are cults and so forth. I said, and then there are people who will just uh, mislead you. I said, do you know the story of uh, Bart Ehrman? No, he said, I, I don't. I said, well, let me, let me tell about Bart Ehrman. I said, Bart uh, started off as a uh, Lawrence, Kansas, going to an Episcopal church, formal church. He was active as a boy, as a teenager. He helped bring other young people in and, and seemed to love the Lord. Uh, went to Moody Bible Institute, conservative school in Chicago, did quite well, found out he had a flair for Greek, uh, graduated there with honors, went across the city to Wheaton College where Billy Graham went. Then he was, uh, he applied for a teaching fellowship at Princeton and got it. And uh, that's where they pay you to be a student. Uh, four year free ride through Princeton. In his last year, he did a research project on the book of Mark. His professor gave his paper back, gave him an A on it. But he wrote in the column, he said, perhaps Mark was wrong here. And Bart Ehrman took that paper, and I'm telling you his own story as I read it in a book. He said he took that paper and went to his dorm room, and he got thinking, if Mark was wrong here, Maybe Mark was wrong here. Maybe, maybe Matthew was wrong. Maybe, maybe John. And he said before the afternoon was over, he was questioning everything in the Bible. And he said, I literally gave up my faith, my confidence in God's word. He graduates, gets his PhD, taught four years at Rutger. An opening comes at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he is now today, last I knew he was still teaching, chair of the Department of Religious Studies a complete agnostic, almost an atheist. He's the most, po and I'm telling this to Ron, I said he's the most popular professor on campus. I see him in Time Magazine. I've watched his lectures on YouTube, very literate, very bright, very winsome. He's the most popular professor on campus. They say when he lectures in the big lecture halls, when he walks in the door, the students stand up and cheer like a rock concert. And he just sits about, sets about them to systematically destroy their confidence in the Bible. One of his books is called Mistakes Jesus Made, stuff like that. So I said, Ron, you gotta be careful where you're looking. You come across a book like that, destroy your confidence in God's word. So finally, after some more examples, we talked about Billy Graham and Charles Templeton and some of those other people that, Charles Templeton, you know, wrote the book Farewell to God used to preach alongside Billy Graham, became an agnostic. I said, uh, Ron, I see we're circling in over Baltimore Airport. I said, uh, 
I said, we live six, mile, six hours from here. I said, I used to commute to Johns Hopkins University. I came down here to Baltimore Hebrew College. But I said, chances are I'll, I'll never see you again, Ron. Man, you, you've been friendly. I've enjoyed it. My wife has your phone number, your email. We'll try to keep in touch. I said, if I send you a book, would you read it? Yeah, he said, I would. I would. He said, I'm retired. I do a lot of traveling, just kind of enjoy life, not married. He said, I take care of my great aunt. We live up at Taos in Maryland. I said, okay, I'll, I'll send you a book. And we said, yeah, our goodbyes. We flew to Pittsburgh, drove home. Next morning, I'm downstairs praying, God, he'll read a book. I got one shot at him. What shall I send him? And I'm in the family room looking just at eye level, and I see Lee Strobel's The Case for Faith. I said, yeah, that, that would be a good place for him to hook on where, where we were. I pulled it off the shelf, and it was uh, all dog-eared and marked. I can't send him a rag like that. And you know, at the end of that same shelf, I had a brand new copy, hadn't even put my name in it yet. And I said, Lord, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I think this is the book you might want me to send him. I wrapped it up and sent it. And uh, Ron says, okay, he said, I got a couple ahead of it, but I'll be reading it. About a month later, he's uh, backpacking on mules down into some canyon in Mexico. He says, I've started the book. Late in May, he says, uh, now it's first name now. Sometimes it's email. Uh, sometimes he'll call me. Now, Paul, he said, uh, I've stopped doing this, this, and this. Am I making progress? And uh, it's not like you can work your way to salvation, but <clears throat> obviously God's leading this guy. Through the summer, a couple more contacts. September, he says, now I'm dating a lady from Taiwan. He said she, uh, she talks about the, uh, the King James Bible. I guess it's a new word to him. He said, I think she's some kind of a fundamentalist. I'm not sure he really knew what that word meant. But anyhow, so, so we talked about King James, what version, how you know which version. Life went on like that till early in November. And I got a, um, an email from him. He said, uh, Paul, I want you and your wife to pray for me. I'm having a CAT scan on my lung tomorrow. Had his CAT scan, emails me that night, and he said, bad news. He said, third, third stage lung cancer. He said, I guess my 50 years of smoking has caught up with me. Well, that explained why he might be knowing his diet, you know, his health foods now. He's trying to undo the damage. I called him and I said, Ron, I said, we've talked about everything from fundamentalism to you name it. I said, the fact of the matter is it's time for you to start confessing your sins and get right with God. And he said, he said, you're right. That was Tuesday of Thanksgiving. Friday morning, he sent me an email. And he said, Paul, he said, uh, and by the way, I keep all these emails. I have them printed off at home in a file. He said, Paul, he said, I got down my knees, and he said, I confessed my sins as best I could to God. And here's what he said. He said, I asked God to have mercy on this poor wretch of a man. That's what he called himself. Wow. <laughs> and God saved him. I flew the following Tuesday down to Hope Sound and, and Chapel on Wednesday morning. I shared that email with the students. They liked that. I said, does evangelism pay? He just, if I hadn't opened my mouth in West Palm Beach and started that conversation, he always said, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to beat it. He said, in Germany, he said, they got a way of superheating the tumors. He said, I got the money. I'm going to, I might as well spend it on me. And he, uh, he said, he, in, in January, he flew to Germany, did all the treatments, came home. And in late January, he says, it didn't work. He said, it's, it's metastasized in my brain. And unfortunately, he said, I'm shutting down. And at that point, there were no more emails, no more phone calls. And to this day, I've, I've searched the Baltimore Evening Sun and the Towson newspapers for an obituary. I, I think God just took Ron home to heaven. And every time I think of him, I'm, I'm so glad I spoke up to him, started that conversation. And that's just an important point to end this conversation on, because all around us are people who are, who are hurting, they're searching, recovering Catholic, they're in the search of, and uh, we, we listen to a story like that and we can just be amazed. We can just, wow, that was powerful. But the reality of it is, you've had many conversations that did not lead to that point. But nonetheless, you've had conversations that opened the door. What they do with that information is, is between themselves and God, but nonetheless, you open the door through a compliment let me give you another quick example. 
Uh, I was, uh, had just given a lecture in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, for Ashland Seminary, and I'm driving home through Streetsboro, and they just opened a new Walmart. I had one item I needed. So I ran back to housewares, found it, went up to pay. Uh, for some reason, I, I wanted to break a larger bill I had in my wallet, and I gave this large bill to the lady, and she counted back my change and gave me $20 too much. Oh, I said, ma'am, I said, here, you gave me $20 too much. And, uh, oh, she said, thank you. She said, if the, my drawer was short, I'd have to make up in a moment. And I turned to go, feeling good because I had done the right thing. And the Holy Spirit said, son, uh, you got the door open here. You could take this to, to the next level. And, uh, and I knew what the Lord was trying to say to me. And I turned back to this lady and I said, you know, ma'am, there's a time in my life when I wouldn't have given you that $20 back. But I said, there was a day when I gave my heart to Jesus, and now I can't keep $20. It doesn't belong to me. And she looked at me. She didn't say anything. I know she was processing it. But I went on my way feeling like I had obeyed the Lord. And I, and, and, and I shared this uh, the other day. And the next morning was the men's breakfast over here. And Don Meredith met me at the door. And he said, I had a chance last night to take it to the next level with somebody. Awesome. I said, well, good, I'm glad I shared that with you. Now, it doesn't always work. A lot of, a lot of times for, for a conversational opener, I'll, I'll see a couple of people. Maybe I'm sitting at the gate at the airport and I'll see an old couple over there, or any age, but, but even an older couple, and I'll say, well, you two look like honeymooners. <laughs> and they'll smile and they'll say, really? What, what makes you think, well, I just, you know, now I've got the door open doesn't always work. One time I was in a restaurant down here in West Palm, and I saw a young couple sitting in a, in a booth together, and I said, you two look like honeymooners. Well, they both kind of ducked their heads, and, and the guy said, well, she's my secretary, and I'm the boss. <laughs> so I just kind of, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry I bothered you, just got out of that one as best I could. So I don't want to give you the idea that it's always successful. No, it isn't, but Things could be more successful if we would take the initiative. So much so. With the leadership of God and just for our love of people. As a Christian, we love people. Exactly. And uh, trust God to open doors and, and do that. It's, it's so, so important. I appreciate you taking some time and sharing with us today. Really valuable information from my perspective, and I think many others will feel the same as they have throughout the years of you shared this to your students. Uh, one of the statements that Pastor John Stratton made at the last uh, conference that we just closed out with in our outreach weekend, that uh, uh, discipleship is not a spiritual gift, it's a spiritual discipline. Mm -hmm. And as I think of that uh, in, this, in light of this conversation, uh, it's easy to look at somebody like Dr. Paul Kaufman who's, who's got his schooling, he's written his books, obviously it's easy for him to do. But you had a process you had to work through to, right. to break through. It had to become a discipline right. to you before it became a joy and where you're able to have conversations and share the gospel. The world's hurting and people are hurting. Mm -hmm. God, help us to, yes. to walk through doors through conversation yes. and share the gospel. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And again, I want to let everyone know that if you have not purchased his book, uh, From the Classroom to the Heart, uh, you're going to want to do that. Thank you for taking the time and writing this very, very applicable to our hearts and lives uh, in the day and age in which we live. And I appreciate it so very much. Well, thank you and God bless you. Thanks for coming. Wow, it's just that simple. He makes it sound so easy. And really, if we can get past our fears, it really is that simple. We hope that something that you've heard today will encourage you to share the gospel, share the love of Christ with someone. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman, for sharing with us and taking out of your time just a few moments to talk to us about conversational evangelism. If you happen to have any questions about your walk with Christ, about how you can come to know Jesus as your own personal Savior, contact us with the information on the screen before you. You can call us, you can email us, however you see fit. We'd be more than happy to talk with you. May God bless you as you take what you've heard today and put into practice conversational evangelism. God bless you and join us next month for another crucial conversation.